Morning, friends, ladies and gentlemen, senior faculty members, and our delegates for this evening show. It is yet another exciting edition of the prime time, the most important initiative by the IAGS, showcasing the best of the surgical talents in India and across the country. That few words, I welcome you for this edition on this very special day. I have privilege in inviting and introducing our president, Professor Sunil Papak. I am sure IAGS members know about him. And for the delegates who are new to IAGS and new to this platform, I take pride in introducing our president. Professor Sunil Papad is a very ardent advanced minimal access surgeon. He is an eminent endotherapist as well. He has a passion towards endoscopy and endotherapy as well. He is a senior visiting professor to GSL Medical College in the Department of Surgical Gastroenterology. And he heads the Nidhi Hospital, which specializes in gastroenterology. It is a multi-specialty hospital. And it also caters to, by and large, a large, uh, large COVID treatment center. With that few words, I take privilege and pride in inviting Professor Sunil Papak, the president of the IAGS, to introduce and start the program for the day. Over to you, President. Sir. Thank you, Dr. Kanagwell. Good evening, friends. Good evening, uh, faculties. Today, we are having friends joining us, not only from India, but from across the border and across other continents also. The beauty of virtual program is we are getting our colleagues to join from across the world in our academic programs. IAG has started this prime time program last year and this one is 17th IAGS prime time program. IAGS is a body of more than 8,000 laparoscopic surgeons of India and has been doing on an average 30 to 50 academic programs across the year. Since last year, COVID pandemic happened, everybody was forced to go on to virtual platform. And since then, IAGS is also a virtual platform. And now it is doing between 50 to 75 programs on various issues, on various platforms across the year. Today, we are fortunate to have two eminent speakers. The first speaker, Professor Adarsh Chaudhary, who needs no introduction, he is from Delhi. He is a chairman of GI, HPB, and bariatric surgery at Madatna Hospital. He did BS from AMSA and MS from PGI Chandigarh way back in 1981. If I give the full introduction of Professor Adas Chaudhary, it will take half an hour. But I will say a few salient features, which I think is my duty. Even all the gold medals which were there to be won during his MBBS and MS. He worked initially in Chandigarh and then in 1985 moved to Delhi. Started his career as assistant professor and then later on joined GP Panth Hospital as assistant professor and progressed to associate and then professor of GI surgery at GP Panth Hospital. He stayed there at GP Panth Hospital for almost 17 years and then took the position of senior consultants in surgical gastroenterology at Sir Gangaram Hospital for several years. And then he moved to Medanta in his current position. He has love and affection for surgery of inflammatory bowel disease, surgery for pancreas, surgery for rectum, and various GI malignancies. He has delivered almost all the orations in associations of surgeons of India and various other orations in India and abroad. He has been honored with honorary FRCS by Royal College of Surgeons. He has been an ardent teacher to almost thousands of 
surgeons of India on various platforms. And he is known for his very thorough approach towards surgery. He is very direct in his practice. He is a very ardent reader and implements his uh, reading and latest information into his practice. Today being World IBD Day, there is no better speaker for us than Professor Adas Chaudhary. I'm very pleased and privileged to welcome him on IAGS Primetime platform. Welcome, Professor Adas Chaudhary. Thank you very much. Can I share the screen? Please go ahead, sir. Thank you very much uh, uh, for inviting me for this talk. And interestingly, today is the World IBD Day. That just goes to prove that if you have a day for a particular disease, that disease must be having a great degree of importance. Karnakwil? I think his connection is gone. Okay. No, no, we are able to see the slides. Uh, Dr. Adashar, are you with us? Uh, maybe you can just call and... Uh, I'm doing it, sir. I'm doing it. Yes. I'm doing it. At his house, the uh, signal is not good. So he... Uh, uh, the phone call is uh, going unattended property. He's kept yeah. uh, President, sir, uh, can we have the next talk by the time he gets himself aligned? Sir, you are in mute mode, Sunil, sir. Let us wait for a couple of minutes. Sure, sir. He's I will trying take to join. Yes, sir. Because uh, he has been there... Uh, on this platform for last 15 minutes and it was going on nicely. Yeah, so I think he, he is now, he may rejoin now. Yeah, so he will join immediately. <clears throat> I have uh, heard uh, Professor Chaudhary several times talking on his this passionate topic of uh, cell for inflammatory bowel disease. And uh, he was one of the first few surgeons of India who ventured deeply into the surgery for inflammatory bowel disease over an uh, almost uh, 25 years ago. Um, President, sir, can I have the honor of asking a couple of questions before Dr. Adas joins? Yeah, yeah. Uh, if I, I'm sure IBD has been nightmare for all the surgeons alike. Uh, being you a senior surgeon who's into the surgical practice for now more than four decades, if you can recall, what is the nightmare case of IPD if you have ever dealt? If you can briefly let us know how it presented <laughs> and how did you manage it. My first case was my nightmare. You know, when you are new in the practice, what you get is what others don't operate. So the first case which I received for pouch surgery, patient. Uh, came with a paraileostomy abscess. History of a 27-year-old lady with ulcerative colitis of two years duration, steroid dependent, and then perforated in the periphery of Gujarat. <clears throat> and she was operated by one very good surgeon over there. And in emergency, he did a subtotal colectomy and ileostomy. So that was the right Dr. thing. Dr. is joined. Yeah. Uh, you are yes, muted, okay. sir. 
I'm sorry there was a power failure. No, no problem. No Welcome. Object. Yeah. Sorry. No problem. No you can sorry. complete at the end, prior President, yeah. sir. Let us hear. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Uh, my talk, I, I'm going to talk on when is surgery indicated? What are the surgical procedures that we do? And what are the results of surgery? When does a patient of ulcerative colitis need surgery? Surgery may be indicated in emergency and the leading indication is a patient who has acute severe colitis. Fortunately, with good medical management these days, we do not have to operate patients in the emergency. As treating surgeons, as far as possible, avoid doing surgery in the emergency for a patient of ulcerative colitis because the mortality in these patients ranges from 30% to 50%. And fortunately, these days, with the availability of newer drugs, we have to very occasionally operate patients for acute severe colitis. Majority of surgery which is done for ulcerative colitis is elective surgery. The leading indication is intractability. Patients who do not do well medically, they've been on long-term medical management. They are not doing well. We also know that ulcerative colitis is a precancerous disease. Once the duration exceeds five to seven years, the chances of cancer increase. So if you grossly see how is surgery placed in ulcerative colitis, in the first year, if a patient has ulcerative colitis, the leading indication will be an occasional case who has acute severe colitis. As time goes, patient is on medical management, the leading indication is intractability, steroid dependence, side effects of drugs a poor quality of life and in later part the leading indication becomes development of cancer what do we do at surgery once we decide that we have to operate a patient today the gold standard the benchmark of surgery is to do an ileal pouch anal anastomosis and about 90 percent of patients who come to us are candidates for ileal pouch anal anastomosis or restorative proctor a minority of patients might be candidates for a proctocolectomy and permanent ileostomy. I've written this operation of subtotal and colectomy and ileal anastomosis for an occasional patient. And today, the only time we will do it is in a young female who has ulcerative colitis. So we will do this operation because it does not affect the subsequent chances of bearing a child. Otherwise, an ileal anastomosis is rarely ever done because we all know that ulcerative colitis starts from the rectum, so hardly any patients are candidates for ileal anastomosis. Important, when should you not do a pouch procedure? If your diagnosis of ulcerative colitis is doubtful, if you have a suspicion of Crohn's disease, a pouch procedure should not be done because if it's a Crohn's disease, the chances of failure of pouch are very high. It appears to logic that patients who have prior sphincter damage or dysfunction are not candidates for a pouch procedure. Patients who have rectal cancer or patients who have previous small bowel resections also cannot undergo a pouch procedure. Also, for surgeons who do this procedure, realize patients who are very tall, it may be difficult to do a pouch procedure in them and patients who are morbidly obese it's very difficult to do a pouch procedure. So if you have a patient who's got morbid obesity, has ulcerative colitis, you first have to do a bariatric procedure to bring the weight down. And then only these patients can undergo surgery because in a morbidly obese op op a patient, it's very difficult even to construct a stoma because the bowel doesn't come out. So these patients are a big challenge. So in an ileal pouch in anastomosis, we do a total colectomy. And then we preserve the distal four to five centimeter of the rectal stump. And we construct a J pouch with a stapler. And the most important prerequisite of this pouch is, many times I'm asked is, oh, how long do you make the pouch? To my mind, a pouch should be at least 20 centimeter long. And the capacity of the pouch should be about 300 cc. So we routinely instill saline into the pouch for reasons that it irrigates the pouch, takes away the fecal matter, takes away the shows any chance of leak if anywhere there, and also tells us about the capacity of a pouch. And then it's important and technically demanding 
that the rectal stump should not be too big because if you leave too big a rectal stump, the patient will have problems from the retained rectal mucosa. So majority of times the stapler is fired about four to five centimeters from the anal verge. So you have short rectal stump and then by a stapled anastomosis, you construct a pouch and majority of pouches today are two stage pouches, meaning that we first do a colectomy, construct a pouch, anastomose and do an ileostomy. And after a period of about three months, we close the ileostomy. There's a subgroup of patients who may not be candidates for a two-stage procedure, and they may need a three-stage procedure in the form of a colectomy first, then we do a pouch, and then we close the ileostomy. This is a very good procedure for patients who are malnourished, who are on high dose of steroids or immunosuppressed. If you do a pouch in them, they have poor wound healing, they have hypoalbumia, they may have problems. So a three-stage procedure is helpful. Another indication of doing a three-stage procedure is if your diagnosis of ulcerative colitis is doubtful. Suppose you're not sure it's Crohn's disease or it is ulcerative colitis. The best way is to do a subtotal colectomy, subject the entire specimen for histopathology. And once the report comes, then you can uh, do the required operation. When you do a uh, surgery for ulcerative colitis, there are problems in these patients. These patients are not normal patients, they have been on high dose of steroids, they are malnourished, and the commonest complications are septic complications. You may have pelvic sepsis, there might be leaks from the pouch, there may be a pouch cutaneous fistula, there may be a pouch vaginal fistula, and about 10 to 30% of patients may have pouchitis of varying grades. Fortunately, majority of these patients can be managed with drugs. A subgroup of patients, the pouch does not function, that they have repeated diarrhea, they have poor quality of life. And majority of these patients, if you retrospectively review their data, the leading cause of pouch failure is a mistaken diagnosis of Crohn's disease that you thought it's ulcerative colitis and did a surgery and later turned out to be Crohn's disease. And also patients who have uh, uh, septic complications, they may lead to uh, have pouch failure. Uh, adhesive obstruction is commonly seen in patients who undergo pouch procedure, but fortunately, majority of them resolve conservatively. They do not need surgery. And once you discuss the pros and cons of doing a pouch procedure, you must always discuss the female patient whose childbearing age that there may be fertility problems because when you operate in the pelvis, you construct a pouch, there may be fibrosis, and the fallopian tubes might get entangled in this fibrotic tissue, and then they may have fertility problems. So the patient should be apprised of this. But once you have a bigger target, you have a target of cancer, you have bigger problems, small deterrents should not make us take away our eyes from the target. In the last couple of years, what has not changed in ulcerative colitis? The indications for elective surgery haven't changed. But the reluctance to refer for surgery with the gastroenterologist persists. We are partly to blame for that because we do not show eagerness to operate these patients. And there is some way there is a stigma attached with surgery for ulcerative colitis, which we as surgeons over years have not been able to change. What has changed in the last couple of years? The procedure has been very well standardized. Thankfully, like I said, there is a lesser need for emergency colectomy today because the drugs are very effective. But there's a flip side to it also, that the ones we get to operate these days are very sick patients. They've received immunosuppression, high dose of steroids, so they are much sicker patients. So we are using more and more of three-stage procedures because these patients are referred late to us. And one of the greatest advantages in the last couple of years has been the use of minimally invasive techniques in doing pouch surgery and technically demanding, but pouches constructed laparoscopically have shown excellent results. And there is also evidence that possibly because less adhesions are formed, these patients might do better than the open procedure. But laparoscopic uh, restorative proctoclectomy is a technically demanding operation, but there is enough evidence today that it is in no way inferior to the open technique. So this is a picture of the sort of patients we get these days who are on immunosuppression, who have high dose of steroids, you see what happens to their wounds. They have poor wound healings. 
they are stomas retract so the patients we get these days to operate are much sicker patients because the availability of drugs the patients are referred much later to surgery what needs to change what we as surgeons need to change we need to define the success of treatment what is successful treatment in ulcerative colitis today patients who undergo pouch with us pass about four to seven stools per day they might have occasional nocturnal incontinence they can eat whatever they want they have active social life and about 50% of them do need antidiarrheals at some time so majority of these patients have good quality of life and many of them say that i wish i had got operated earlier so we have to push this case of acceptance of surgery as a patient friendly treatment options and the fault lies with us because we as surgeons have not long criticize and analyze medical data because there are so many flaws in the studies which are presented uh, in the patients who undergo medical treatment i often show the picture like uh, uh, like this colon for a patient to my gastroenterologist and i tell them what is the point of saving a colon like this we've had patients who came walking and then after 5 to 7 years of medical management they're lying on stretchers because the gastroenterologist says see i have saved the colon but what's the point of saving a colon for a patient so we need to tell the gastroenterologist that we agree that hurrying for surgery may not be good but delaying is definitely harmful we need to identify non responders early because if we operate at the right time the results of surgery are excellent and we need to emphasize that ultimately it's about saving lives not about saving colons i do not understand why in the medical literature the end point of treatment is avoidance of colectomy and not is the quality of life or the quality of life of the patient coming to the problem of crohn's disease we all know that crohn's disease is a problem we believe in india we believe that we don't get crohn's disease don't be under this impression crohn's disease exists in india it is just because we do not know how to diagnose it we say it doesn't happen and crohn's disease we know is a chronic disease it can affect anything from mouth to anus and it goes in a pattern of inflammation to stricture to penetration and needs a lot of skill and management it's worth realizing that 80% of patients of crohn's disease will need surgery in their lifetime so surgeons have a very important role to play in management of crohn's disease the leading cause of need for surgery is because of failure of medical management and because of development of complications this paper which was published in 1991 stands true till today that in a vast majority of patients the indication of surgery is not only failure of medical management but these patients we all know develop fistulae they have obstructions they have abscesses and they need surgical intervention there are basically three surgical procedures for crohn's disease first and foremost is the principle in crohn's disease is to save as much length of the bowel as possible so we do as far as possible a procedure which conserves the bowel so stricturoplasty has been a very popular operation we all know how it's done occasionally we have to do bowel resection and sometimes surgery is needed to drain abscesses there has been a reluctance again in referring patients of crohn's disease for surgery and medical treatment has been continued to them for a long time way back as early as 1994 when open surgery was done even then when the patients were asked their perspective majority of patients wished they had undergone surgery earlier no patient very few patients regretted undergoing surgery so we have data like this this study which was published in 2017 and in, in uh, 29 centers from holland for non structuring crohn's disease patients who underwent laparoscopic ileocecal resection versus remicade this was a randomized controlled open label trial and it showed that patients who underwent surgery their results were as patients who received remicade 
And interestingly, in follow-up, patients who received infleximab, many of them subsequently needed surgery. There are many such studies which have shown the superiority of laparoscopic surgery as compared to management in patients who have ileocecal Crohn's disease. And minimal invasive surgery in Crohn's disease makes a lot of sense because it does not induce fibrosis. There is less stress response and the quality of life these patients remain excellent. But it's not all rosy. The problem with surgery in Crohn's disease is nearly all patients will develop recurrence. After five years, 25% patients will need surgery. And 10 years, nearly 30, 60% will need re-surgery. And there is data to suggest that once you do surgery and you do endoscopy, within a week, proximal to the anastomosis, some recurrence starts. So recurrence is the rule rather than exception in patients who undergo surgery. So what we need to do is to learn that which are the patients in whom there are higher chances of post-operative recurrence. Once we identify these patients, medical management in them should start immediately after surgery so that the chances of recurrence is decreased. And also, colonoscopic or enteroscopic assessment in these patients should be very regular and should not be done in other patients because then you save a lot of money because in the patients who are low risk, you don't need to do them. But patients in whom who had primarily a penetrating type of disease, patients who have perianal disease, patients who had prior small bowel resections, patients in whom more than 50 centimeters of small bowel is removed and who are actively smoking, the chances of recurrence of Crohn's after surgery is very high. What can we do to prevent post-operative recurrence? There was some belief in the past that if you do a side-to-side -side anastomosis, recurrence is less, but this has not been proven. Then there is a, in 2003, Kono from Japan described a technique where you only do the anastomosis on the anti-mesenteric border in a belief that probably the recurrence is less, but it has not been substantially proven. One interesting concept has been recently proposed and it makes a lot of sense that routinely what we've been doing in Crohn's disease is a resection staying close to the mesentery. We now realize that mesentery is an organ in itself and mesentery is itself a source of inflammation which creeps onto the intestine. So the mesentery provides inflammatory mediators, fibrocytes, which come onto the industry and cause twitching. So this study by Coffey, which showed that if you include a white mesentery in your bubble resection, as we do for cancer, the chances of recurrence are much less. And for those of you who are very, who are interested in this interesting subject of how mesentery controls systemic inflammation and Crohn's disease, this is a fantastic article, which tells us how mesentery is important in the modulation of the ulceration and stricturing in Crohn's disease. Surgeons who are involved in Crohn's disease know one of the biggest problems is perianal Crohn's disease. These patients have rectal disease. They are very difficult to manage. And the chances of developing a perianal fistula in these patients is higher. By the end of 10 years, nearly 20% of these patients may have a perianal fistula, which is a great challenge to manage. So if you have a patient who's got a perianal fistula and Crohn's disease, before you start treating this patient, you need to know four things. A complete anatomy of the fistula, best seen on an MRI with a 3D deconstruction. Number of the external openings, is there an associated abscess? And most important is presence of rectal disease. Because patients who have rectal disease, the outcome in these patients is not very good. If you ask me, how do you manage a perianal fistula in Crohn's disease? If it's a simple asymptomatic perianal fistula, patient has no rectal disease, this patient needs no treatment, just observation. If you have a patient who's got a simple fistula, which is symptomatic, no rectal disease, in these patients you can do an EUA, you can do a fistulotomy. But if you have a patient who's got a complex perianal fistula and a rectal disease, or patients who have recurrent fistulae, 
in these patients, the standard of treatment is drain all abscesses, place a seat on. Try to avoid doing a fistulectomy because wounds will never heal, sphincters will get damaged. A draining seat on is the best option. It prevents incontinence, is the safest, it keeps the fistula alive, and you have to be actively treating medically these patients. How long these cetones have to be in place is still not answered because if you keep the cetone in place for too long, it itself prevents healing of the fistula. So a randomized trial is needed on this. We still do not have an answer. But I am again reiterating, avoid putting cutting cetones or doing a surgery like fistulectomy, which damages the sphincter in these patients. So where do we stand? We need to understand that in ulcerative colitis, surgery cures the disease because you take away the colon. You prevent the chances of development of cancer. You take away the disease so patients do well. Whereas Crohn's disease, it can affect any part of the small bowel. So essentially, you treat complications of the disease. Recurrence of the disease might happen. So we have to conserve as much bowel as possible. So what I say is that in inflammatory bowel disease, it is the timing of what you do. If you delay the surgery too long, you increase the mortality and morbidity. The results of surgery get affected. You have to do three-stage procedures, which harms the patient, which is more expensive, needs more hospital stay. So delay in surgery is harmful. But we also have to balance the fact that unnecessary surgery should be avoided because early surgery in patients, even it's not indicated, exposes the patient to an risk of surgery. With the gastroenterologists, we should understand, join hands with them. We have a common enemy. And when not, there is nothing stronger bond between two hunters when they have a common enemy. And it's a duty of the surgeons to improve the results of surgery and to show commitment in inflammatory bowel disease so that we get timely and appropriate referrals from gastroenterologists to us. Thank you very much, and I'll be very happy to answer questions on this. Thank you very much, Professor Adars. Excellent lecture. And as always, to the point. And this topic is very near to your heart. So I, I know from last 25 years uh, of talking to you that how closely you are following these patients. For, let us first discuss ulcerative colitis. As you said that uh, for elective surgery, we need to get patients early to give good results. But with the advent of biologics, what is your experience? When are you getting the patient? After biologics? Uh, that's a very good question, Sunil. What biologic uh, the data suggests that with the advent of new drugs, the frequency of emergency surgery has decreased, but the frequency of elective surgery has not decreased. So we are getting patients much later. The incidence of elective surgery has not decreased. The incidence of emergency has decreased, but now we get sicker patients. And for the last five, seven years, we are doing more three-stage procedures than, than we were doing earlier. Yeah. So if you get a patient after biological treatment, when would you operate? So literatures, many studies suggest that these drugs do not adversely affect the results of surgery. But there are many studies which show, yes, the result, they, they, they affect the results of surgery. So I'll operate. I, I won't delay this surgery, but I'll always do a subtotal colectomy first, wait for a period of three to four months, let the patient improve, and then do a pouch surgery because of two reasons. Once the tissue are very friable in these patients, and second, God forbid they leak then you have big problems. Yeah. And when you said you will do three stage, does any time you come across a patient, say patient has been bad, lot of steroids taken, but once you have done the first stage and you have given the rectal mucus fistula and ileostomy, and after three months when you see patient is perfectly healthy, do you ever consider modified two stage? Yes, yes, yes. We have been able, we have been able to do it a couple of patients. It's not the rule. There are some patients who improve 
so significantly and the surgery flows like silk, in them we might not do an earliest. But that will be less than about 5 to 7 percent, in 95 percent will still do. Deep, you want to ask a question? Yeah, just, just a comment and a question, sir. Sir, when uh, you're doing the rectal resection for inflammatory bowel disease, do you leave the mesorectum behind? Because today I you know, see a lot of surgeons are not, you know, they are leaving behind the mesorectum, unlike what we used to do. No, no, we, we don't leave the mesorectum behind. Yes. Because I, I think if you leave the mesorectum behind, there are two problems. One is that it makes the pelvis less roomy. The, it, it occupies, and second, it causes bleeding from there and that infection and sepsis. So surgery should be just done like you do for cancer because I see no sense in keeping these records. Absolutely. I, I would agree with that. And I comment, I think there should be a tendency for, you know, a joint uh, seeing the patient uh, when the patient comes. I, I know it's an ideal situation, but that is where because most of the patients who are referred to surgery late, they complain that we were never told about this option until recently. Yeah, absolutely true, Deep. And uh, I would agree that always we should do TME, total mesorectal excision, to give the best results. Uh, Dr. Adars? He's frozen again. Yeah. So what is your experience, Deep? Are you getting more patients after biological treatment now? Absolutely. 90% uh, of our patients who come to us are very late and uh, they are sick. And uh, I would disagree with Dr. Chaudhary because most of these patients, they, you know, they have pancytopenia because of the disease and because of the biological treatment and they are in bad shape. And obviously, when these people you operate, uh, they are at high risk of complications, burst abdomen, sepsis, mortality is even, you know, higher. Yeah. Let us discuss also, about... Uh, also, Sunil, what you were mentioning, mm. you know, after subcortical colectomy, the ileostomy which you are preparing, one should be very careful in this ileostomy. Never take it that they are temporary ileostomy. Make it as if it's a permanent ileostomy. Because of a good percentage of these patients will never turn up for surgery and they will end up as a permanent ileostomy in these patients. Yeah, it's an art to do a proper and good loop ileostomy so that it works equally well like end ileostomy. In, in our experience over the last 25 years, uh, what we have observed is uh, in the last five years, the, the references for surgery of ulcerative colitis are gradually decreasing more and more. And whatever patients are coming, are coming after the biological treatment, particularly adalimumab. And several patients are presenting in emergency with perforation or a toxic megacolon. And obviously in emergency, we go for subtotal colectomy as a first stage. Deep, what is your uh, preference regarding the, the rectal remnant? What do you do? You do mucus fistula or you close or? I, I close it. I don't do the mucus fistula. There is a one theory that if you close it and put it back inside pelvis, it may open up and uh, uh, it can lead to sepsis. Any experience? Like yes, that? it has happened on a couple of occasions, but I still feel you know, leaving the rectal stuff inside staple and then over it uh, is a better option with a black thread so we can find it easily in the next surgery. Uh, but yes, that is a potential risk as you rightly said. And how long do you keep your rectal sum? When, suppose you are doing subtotal colectomy, we divide at the lower end of sigmoid only. And because we bring it down at the lower end of our midline incision, that's why we keep the length sufficient so that it reaches the skin. What is so your we just preference? we divide it at the sacral promotion. Right. What is what we have faced whenever we have gone back after such surgery, and obviously it has been done at other places, and they have not taken precautions. Sir, welcome. Yeah. The storm blowing outside. Yeah, us. yeah, yeah. No problem. Sorry. We have been just discussing about the emergency cases where we do the subtotal colectomy. So obviously, you showed a rectal mucus fistula, and uh, I also like to have rectal mucus fistula. So, is it your preference to do that yeah, in all yeah. cases, or it, you it, select it, your it cases? Makes sort of, it makes sort of sense because 
rectal fistula has two mucous fistula has two advantages. One, God forbid, if it leaks inside, it causes problem. Second, in occasional patients who have bleeding from the mucous fistula, then you can irrigate it by an external opening. It helps. Yeah. And how often you see your uh, IPA cases in follow-up? We have a very rigorous follow-up in uh, IPA cases because uh, invariably when you close the ileostomy, they have profuse diarrhea. So they, these patients are very, patients with ulcerative colitis have a typical personality. They keep following you up, they don't leave you. So the follow-up fortunately in this disease is very good. Yeah. And also what you said earlier in your talk, that unless we give good results and do proper follow-up, we, we may not get more patients from our medical colleagues, physician colleagues. I, I have a belief this is a surgery which should be done in people who are genuinely interested in this. You know that. Yeah. Because this is a technically demanding surgery and these patients are, they don't take complications well because they're on steroids, they're immunocompromised. And one of the most single important thing is if you have pelvic sepsis, that affects the quality of life. Pouch cannot distend in the pelvis and these patients don't do well. Yeah. And what is your treatment protocol for pouchitis? Uh, fortunately, Majar, uh, I and a lot of evidence today suggests that pouchitis essentially is a return of subclinical ischemia. If you make good pouches, they are well mobilized, they calm down, the chances of pouchitis are lesser. But I really have to excise a pouch for pouchitis. They do well with the, uh, uh, antibiotics and metronidazole. My leading cause of pouch excision is septic complications. Fortunately, pouchitis is not a big problem. Uh, with as you do more and more procedures. Yeah. I had uh, an interesting patient of uh, who presented with uh, enterocutaneous fistula almost three to four years after IPA. And uh, on examination and investigation, it was diagnosed as tuberculosis of the pouch. So I did a, a diverting ileostomy and started AKT. And after nine months, we closed the diverting ileostomy and that pouch survived and it's still five years down the Lucky. line. Lucky. Yeah. yeah. Another patient, we developed uh, anthrocutaneous fistula from pouch because of the roundworm. Patient developed roundworm infestation and one of the roundworm came out through the stepper line of the pouch. And uh, that was also interesting. I presented that... Uh, case in one of the conference. Now, do you ever use uh, biologics for the treatment of pouchitis? Uh, rarely ever, rarely ever, rarely ever. Because once that stage comes, I'll refer him to a gastroenterologist. Fortunately, we have a gastroenterologist who has a great committed interest in IBD. So I will not venture there. But I don't think there's probably one or two patients. But do they come back to you after biologics or what happens to them? Uh, very few, I, I don't remember a pouchitis patient getting up uh, because I think if a patient who has pouchitis needs biological, will most likely need a pouch excision because would have reached that stage by that time. So mostly he or she is converting into Crohn's. Yeah, that's if, if you have such bad symptoms, then they must be having Crohn's disease. How often uh, you have seen that you are pouch patients who have been doing well for 10 years and then they start getting converted into but Crohn's? They, no, they don't get converted into Crohn's. This is a wrong notion. They always had Crohn's from the beginning. But yes, there is some evidence that as patients get older, pouch dysfunction might start because of muscular weakness. That once patient you've done a pouch at 30 years, when they become 50 or 60, pouch dysfunction might start. That's, I don't think it ever converts to Crohn's. So that's not true. They always okay. had Crohn's. The first case was misdiagnosed. How do you see, Dr. Adars, in future 10 years down the line? Would we be operating on ulcerative colitis or it will be all medical treatment? No, no, no. We always will be operating for ulcerative colitis. It will never happen because, if, because cancers will continue to occur in ulcerative colitis. Yeah. And, the, and you cannot take drugs all your life. Surgery is one time. It's durable. It's effective if properly done. So I don't think. Maybe we do lesser patients in emergency. But in last 10 years in most centers, the number of elective surgery has not reduced. Yeah. So that's a good sign for surgeons, you know. <laughs> it is going to be there.
uh, for them to continue doing pouch surgery. One uh, practical question regarding, you said it is important to have four centimeter from anal verge. So do you have a method of measuring? Yes, pouch? yes, it's very simple. That it should be just distal to your distal IP joint. I learned it from Victor Fazio, that you do a per rectal examination, your stapler should be about one to two centimeter above your distal IP joint. Right. That's a very practical tip. Mm -hmm. Regarding Crohn's disease, how often you are called up to do surgery nowadays? Uh, we do about uh, 10 cases a year. Okay. Approximately. And mostly that would be segmental resection? Oh, uh, about 50-50. 50 will try to do structuroplasty. 50 will be a segmental resection. Yeah. Because we are seeing a lot of uh, NRI patients nowadays of Crohn's who, who, are, uh, who have undergone investigations and treatment abroad. And the photograph which you showed with Seton, I have seen few patients with multiple Setons in their anal fistulae. Yeah, yeah. We have patients who like, like a golf course. They yeah. have multiple fistulae like that. But it's a very difficult problem to manage. Very difficult. Yeah. And they are on adalimumab and nobody yes. knows what will what is when this hectons needs to come out. Yeah, nobody knows. Nobody knows. Yeah. So any further question, Deep, you want to ask? No, that's fine. Yeah. Thank you very much, Professor Adil Thank Chaudhary, you. for you your time much. and wonderful Thank lecture. You. Thank you very and much. We look forward to seeing you more and more on this platform. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, over to Dr. Kanagwar. <clears throat> thank you, uh, President, and thank you, Professor Adar Chaudhary, for uh, giving us a very brilliant uh, overview of the IBD on this very special international IBD day. Uh, now we move on to the next segment of uh, the session, the management of rectal cancer. Now, may I have the honor of inviting and introducing Professor Pavanindra Lala. Professor Pavanindalal, sir, is an executive director at the National Board of Examination. He is spearheading the most tough phase of the executive directorship of the National Board, I am sure. Because a lot of difficulties in handling the curriculum and the exam. And he is also having a dual role of director professor at the Department of General Surgery, Malonasas Medical College and Associated Lopnak Hospital. And he is instrumental to many firsts. He is the head of the clinical center. He is the editor in chief of the MAMC Journal of Medical Sciences. And he is the vice president, International College of Laparoscopic Surgeons. He is the president elect of the India Hernia Society. And uh, he is the uh, president of the Association of Surgeons of India Daily Chapter. And uh, he is the chairman of the Surgical Instruments Committee of the BIS. And ladies and gentlemen, I am very, very happy to share you. It is a father son duo who has been honored with the coveted Dr. B.T. Rai National Award. It is a very, very rare uh, combination to have both a father and son being awarded the Dr. B.T. Rai Award. And I am sure Dr. Pavanindalal will take us through the journey of the rectal cancer session. Over to you, Professor Pavanindalal. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Kanakbel, for that very elaborate introduction and for your kind words. A uh, very good evening to all the viewers this evening on this IAGS prime time. It's my great privilege to uh, introduce the next speaker this evening, uh, Dr. Deep Goel. Uh, he is an eminent uh, surgeon, uh, senior director in minimal access surgery, bariatric and surgical gastroenterology department at the BLK Super Speciality Hospital in New Delhi. Uh, a person who has uh, a keen interest in uh, colorectal surgery and uh, this evening he is going to enlighten us on the rectal cancer management in the year 2021 as it stands. So without further wasting any time and without coming in between you and him, over to Dr. Deep Goel for this for his talk. Thank you, Professor Lal. Uh, just give me a minute. I am sharing my Can you see the slides? Yes. Yes, sir. Okay. Dear friends, what an honor and pleasure to be here among friends and somebody who has touched my life in more than one way. 
I thank the leadership of IHS for finding me worthy of this opportunity. As we know that uh, incidence of rectal cancer in our country is increasing. And unfortunately, we are seeing much younger people who are being affected by this disease. And in next half an hour, I will try to cover this vast topic uh, to the best of my ability. Well, I have no conflict to disclose for this particular talk. And the first description in literature of rectal cancer is found in 1376 by John Ardine. And what he said, he compared the rectal cancer with bubo. Uh, you know, bubo is uh, in Latin means uh, owl. And uh, he did say that uh, a person who develops rectal cancer, you know, God help him. And uh, things have changed drastically. And uh, Professor Bill Heald, in his presidential lecture in 1982, which was published in 1988, he said that surgery is a primarily a craft. And I see little shame in regarding a surgeon as a person who exists to do operation. I couldn't agree with him more. But since then, I think things have changed drastically for rectal cancer management. It has become a multi-modality approach. And keeping that in mind, in our country a couple of years back, some of us formed a group, uh, rectal cancer treatment outcome group. The aim was to standardize the protocols and optimize the result of rectal cancer. So this is a timeline of rectal cancer surgery history starting from Sir Mile, who described APR, and to our surprise, the technique which he uh, described in 1907 is in fact valid today as an E-Lab. And, and this timeline continued with Dixon, Golliger, Sir Park, Heald, Buse, Jacobs, and recently Antonio Lacy, who described trans TME. Well, uh, these are some of the things which have been game changer for rectal cancer treatment and multimodality approach. We actually need to see how we can properly diagnose and stage a disease so we can properly outline the management and the sequence of the management to give an optimal result. Well, if you come to the staging, endo ultrasound and MRI, these are the two cornerstone of local staging. They are normally complementary to each other. Both are acceptable as a diagnostic modality if it is an early T1, T2, N0 lesion. But when it comes to T3, T4, MRI has an edge. Sometimes both are required to differentiate between T2, T3 or N0, N1. Endo ultrasound has an advantage that we can do an FNAC through this. Gina Brown in 2006 and 2013 published Mercury 1 and 2 trials and she said very clearly that high resolution MR accurately predicts whether resection margins will be involved or not and obviously this will help us avoiding over treatment. Also MRI is the modality of choice for restaging or reassessing the effect of the treatment. Dynamic contrast MRI when we do what we information we need to know the depth of tumor height of the tumor nodes and we obviously diagnose these nodes whether they are malignant or not by their size shape irregular borders or mixed signal there are two factors extramural vascular invasion and circumferential resection margins who are independent risk factor and if we talk about local recurrence and r0 resection crm is very very important MRI also tells us about the mucinous content because mucinous predicts that to read an MRI and to have an effective surgery as a surgeon we need to know the facial anatomy of the rectum which is very very complex but if you put your mind to it it's not very difficult as you see on the left side the MRI picture it depicts the different layers of the rectum very very clearly and the red circle outside shows the mesorectum, the envelope, which needs to be removed as a TME, which I will be discussing in a while. The picture on the left is an is a image of a T3 rectal cancer. You can see how rectum is coming out uh, from the muscle layer, but within the fascia. And on the right side is a T2 image where it is confined to the walls of the rectum. This is a picture of endo ultrasound showing how nodes can be visualized by endo ultrasound. Coming to the distant staging, because you need to see whether this is an early stage disease, localized disease, or a metastatic disease. 
CT scan of the abdomen and the chest are recommended uh, imaging modalities uh, before we put a knife on the patient, before we plan a treatment on the patient. PET scan recently has been in fashion. There is no recommendation at the moment for a PET scan routine use, but we end up doing or seeing PET scan in most of the patients we receive. The indication of the PET scan would be people who already have a metastasis or we suspect that patient is likely to have a metastasis and also as a follow-up after the treatment. In spite of all these high-end investigations available to us, I would say that surgeons should never forget the most important tool even today is, is his finger. A finger can diagnose and assess so many things which put together other investigations may not. As a surgeon, I want to know the distal distance from the tumor. I want to know the fixity. I need to know in a woman whether how is rectovaginal septum, whether it is freely mobile or fixed. I need to know the prostate and seminal vesicle in men. So never forget to use your finger in these patients. Coming to neoadjuvant treatment, the literature is full of confusion, but over the years, we have realized that T1, T2 uh, disease, we can go for upfront surgery, even in the low rectal cancers. Late T3 and T4, there is no doubt that they will be benefited by new adjuvant treatment. The controversy remains for the late T2, that's an ugly T2 tumor and early T3 tumor. Well, the indications differ in different regions. Most of the Americans would put these patients to new adjuvant treatment. Most of the Europe as well. Uh, barring UK, India is a mixed bag, but in a selected group of patients like T3 and 0 with extension of less than 5 millimeter into the extramural space, an upfront surgery can be done. A million dollar question is, can neoadjuvant therapy increase the chances of sphincter preservation? Well, it's a very difficult question to answer. I would say yes and no. There is no high quality evidence at the moment to suggest that it does reduce the chances, increase the chances of sphincter preservation. And I will tell you why. Most likely, the neoadjuvant treatment downsizes the tumor size and ease of operation. So you are able to reach distal to the tumor probably easier after a neoadjuvant treatment, which has downsized the tumor size. If you are not able to go beyond the tumor, even if it's a T3 tumor, it's a bulky tumor, then obviously you can't do anterior resection. You'll have to do an abdominal perineal resection. The next big question comes, what kind of radiation? A short course radiation, which is given for five days, or a long course radiation, which is given for four to five weeks, is better? Well, there are various trials which have been done. And uh, Swedish trial and Dutch trial was for short course versus upfront surgery. Polish trial and PROC trial were for short versus long course. And... Ultimately, they say that there is no difference in the disease-free survival or distant metastasis or local recurrence or late toxicities in either way you choose. It's, I think, a matter of your protocols. So how do I choose uh, the radiation protocol? If I see a bulky tumor where I want to downsize, I will go for a long course treatment. Also because uh, you get chemotherapy with that and you wait for 10 to 10, 8 to 10 weeks after surgery, it gives you enough time to downsize the tumor. A borderline tumor, ugly T2 or early T3, where there is a, uh, there is a debate about whether a new adjuvant treatment should be given, but the threatened CRM margins are there on MRI. I would like to sterilize my margins. I will give a short course therapy and take the patient for surgery after a week. A new concept is developing of total new adjuvant treatment. It is where we give total treatment before surgery, which is complete radiation and a four months of chemotherapy. Uh, the indications are in cases where there are locally advanced cancer and which are at a high risk of positive margin. And also after a, a routine new adjuvant protocol, you see there is a partial response and you still feel that you will may not, may not be able to get clear margins. These are the patients who should be taken for total new adjuvant treatment. And the advantages are that you know, chemotherapy is tolerated better in preoperative setting as come to postoperative use. And you also have an option of, you know, considering a non-operation if there's a complete clinical response after total neoadjuvant treatment. There is a very, very weak evidence to suggest that it may increase the sphincter preservation rate after complete neoadjuvant treatment if there's a good response. 
This is a famous picture from Sir Bill Heald of TME plane, and you can see how a bilobed mesorectum looks like a baby buttock, very famously described. And in the second picture, you can see the neurovascular bundle and the ureter. And with the advent of the holy plane, uh, which was an avascular plane between distal and parietal uh, fascia of the mesorectum, sharp dissection under vision, what it does, it reduces the local recurrence from 40% before holy plane existed or was described. Uh, to close to 8%. So it was a game changer as far as surgical techniques was concerned. And Gerald Buse for Germany described local excision in, you know, for more sphincter preservation, especially for low rectal cancers. And indications are in T1, T2, N0 disease where patient is not willing for uh, permanent stoma uh, or patient is fit for abdominal surgery. This can be also done under clinical trials. Antonio Lacy in 2010 described trans anal TME. Again, this is, was the idea and the principle was to save the sphincter in more and more patients. These are for difficult distal rectal cancer where you think that abdominal clearance may not be possible. There is at the moment increased incidence of urethral injury uh, in these uh, cases. There's a steep learning curve, it's not easy to do. And a lot of under uh, randomized trials are still underway. Results are not out. Another method to preserve the sphincter uh, is intersphintic resection between the external and internal muscle. You dissect and you are able to go beyond uh, the tumor. Uh, you need to do a polo anal anastomosis in most of these cases. Laparoscopic and robotic dissection probably, probably is easier to go down that far. The problem of the colon anastomosis remains is continence, but you need to have a dedicated team uh, who counsel these patients, who treat these patients with passion and uh, look after them. Another difficult question is how far down is enough? How much distal section margin is enough? Well, if you talk about proximal and mid-rectum, five centimeters is what is accepted. But if you talk about distal rectal, Two centimeters is today what is most widely accepted. But because of new adjuvant treatment, uh, the distal margins are now further shrinking. I would say any margin which is negative in patients who wants to save sphincter is acceptable today. As I said before, the circumferential resection margin is an independent risk factor. And an MRI definitely tells us that you know, whether this patient has a threatened margin or not, whether this patient requires new adjuvant treatment. On MRI, more than two millimeter is an ideal uh, patient where you will, you will take up the patient for surgery and less than one millimeter is a poor prognostic factor. Another very good thing which happened is that today we can analyze the quality of surgery. A surgeon can be audited by a pathologist. We may not like it as an egoistic surgeon, but this is a truth and I think this is a very good thing. If you macroscopically assess the mesorectum, you can divide it into a complete mesorectal excision, which is a very good thing, or a near complete, which is not so good thing, and a poor specimen, that is a very bad thing. So they obviously have uh, implication in terms of prognosis and uh, local recurrence. Uh, this is one of the studies which was published in 2018, and it says that both uh, uh, MAMI and CRM are key prognostic factors for patient after rectal resection. Furthermore, MAMI can provide rapid and accurate feedback on surgical quality to guide a surgeon and improve surgical technique, which is vital for quality of control. Another challenge in uh, low rectal cancer is how do we construct the anastomosis? Obviously, like any, anywhere else in the body, ideal anastomosis is tension-free and a well-vascularized anastomosis. For tension-free, we need a good mobilization which we can achieve by doing a complete uh, splenic flexion mobilization if it is required. Also, there is uh, some debate about how do we ligate our inferior mesenteric artery? Should we ligate, ligate it high as it was told to us some years back that uh, if you look at the oncology, a high ligation is better. But today there is no evidence from the oncological point of view that high ligation is as good as low ligation. I normally would prefer a low ligation in our practice if it is possible. Well, this is a high-low trial, which also favors that 
functional outcome of the anastomosis is much better in terms of continence or obstructive urinary symptoms or sexual functions if there is a low ligation. It's, it's not a, a level one evidence, but it is. As I was saying that any anastomosis vascularity is very important. And the best way to see the vascularity is if you can identify it on a naked eye, a pulsating vessel on the edge. It is not always possible. And ICG perfusion recently is, is, is a very good tool to be used. This is a dye which you give one minute before you want to see a, a well perfused uh, both the ends. Pillar 2 trial, which is a multi institutional studies, very clearly indicates that it has a usefulness. Uh, there was total 147 patients and anastomotic leak rate was 1.4 percent. What is important to notice in this study is that 8 percent patients, the resection line was changed after using fluorescein angiogram and there was no leak in these 8 patients. So 1.4 percent of the patients who leaked, in none of them the resection line was changed. Another challenging thing is you know, 20 to 25 percent of the patients, uh, you know, present with liver metastasis. We need to divide them into resectable and non-resectable category. Obviously, the metastasis which is resectable, our aim again is to do to re to achieve R zero resection. How do we treat? Whether we treat the primary first or we treat the metastasis first? Obviously, literature is full of various options. And uh, there is no strong evidence to suggest that one technique is better than another. But what we follow in our department is that we give a short course of radiation to the primary disease. So we have enough time to give chemotherapy uh, to the systemic disease. And then we reassess the patient and then do the surgery. Also, the question comes whether uh, the resectable liver metastasis, whether it could be uh, operated simultaneously or you should do a delayed resection. Again, literature is full of various options, but it will depend upon the magnitude of liver resection you are doing because I would not like two major surgeries to be done in a patient whose general condition is not very good. Also, if you delay the liver resection, a lot of times you do auto selection of these patients because you realize by that time after giving chemotherapy, you are trying to take up the patient for liver resection. You realize that there is a multiple uh, metastasis in the liver or anywhere else. So these patients obviously auto select themselves. So studies fail to identify any clear survival benefit in terms of five year over survival for any of the strategies. So, you know, one has to stick to your institutional policy. Whenever metastasis is non resectable, our aim is not uh, cure, it's the palliation. And you can either do stoma for the primary, you can stent, you can do local radiation to the painful meds if they are in the bone or anywhere else. And you can do palliative chemotherapy depending upon your expectation and the general condition of the patient. Coming to some of the complications, uh, urosexual complications, as I know, is a reality and the incidence is around 5 to 50 percent in literature. Believe me, they are underreported in most of the centers. Today, I think it is very important to understand that whenever we are doing preoperative workup of these patients in the clinical history, we must take a, a very thorough urosexual uh, history of these patients and we must avoid nerve injury during our surgical procedures. And if there are complications, it is good to involve urologists or endologists early in the disease. These are some of the areas where you need to be careful while doing surgery at the IML root, hypogastric nerve plexus, superior hypogastric plexus close to seminal vesicle anteriorly. That is where the denonvillier fascia comes, laterally inferior hypogastric plexus and lateral ligament. Well, this debate has been going for you know decades now. I think it's time to put some rest. I don't think it matters oncologically, whichever technique you use. I think we have enough evidence today. And post-op recovery obviously is better in minimal access surgery, whether you, you do lab or robotic, but they come at a cost of the procedure. But if you look at the cost for the long term or the cost of the society, I think it is equal or maybe there is benefit in minimal access surgery. Obviously, you require expertise to do any of the surgeries. It, is, it will be, I think, not fair to say that open surgery is easy. Believe me, after doing 
minimal invasive surgery for now more than 20 years, I still find open surgery as difficult as any other surgery. Well, I would suggest that one should choose what is good for the patient and one should choose what is best in a given circumstances. If you are not trained to do a particular procedure, there is no need to you know, sweat, do what you know best, give the best result that is what is more important. This is a ROLAR trial which is published in JAMA. It's an international multi-center trial of 400 patients. And what they found is that robotic assisted surgery has no advantage as far as now with surgeons of varying experience. A word about extended dissections. Pelvic excentrations, anterior, posterior, or complete. Well, patients who, who have a fixed disease or who have not responded properly to your conventional new adjuvant treatment, and you think you can still get away with the R0 margin, I think it is in line to do pelvic excentrations or bladder sparing extended resection. And in selected patients in expert hands, they produce good results in terms of local recurrence and overall survival. Looking into the future, I think we are now moving towards personalized treatment in rectal cancer. I think molecular biology imprinting is the way forward by doing next generation sequences from the tissues. We need to know what is the genetic makeup of a particular patient. This will help us in predicting which patients will be benefited from expensive and toxic target therapies. What are the genetic predisposition to the family, whether they are more prone to develop cancers and obviously we can prognosticate and they are now, uh, this protocol is available in NCCN guidelines. Liquid biopsy is again something which is coming up in a big way. You can from the blood of the patient, not only diagnose cancer, but you will have a genetic imprint of this patient and then you can use this genetic imprint for other diseases as well. Targeted therapy. For metastatic disease, I think is a norm today. They, they tend to act on the metastasis itself without causing much damage to the surrounding tissues. And by next generation sequencing, you can choose your patients which will be benefited by target therapy. And once you have a genetic imprint of a patient and you know that which particular gene is likely to cause cancer in a high risk patients, it is possible in future to do gene editing and curing this patient or avoiding that patient to have a cancer in future. Another very interesting concept which has developed, uh, which was popularized by Angelita Habergama from Brazil is watch and wait group. This is in patients who have shown complete clinical response after new adjuvant treatment. There is no sign of cancer in the, in the rectum and which is defined by that you can't feel a tumor by digital rectal examination. And on sigmoidoscopy, you see white flat scar or telangiectasia, whitening of mucosa, and the biopsy taken does not show any tumor. That is what is these patients can be a selected patients who are not willing for surgery or who are high risk patient for surgery or patients who do not want a permanent stoma can be put under watch and wait group, but under strict follow up. They are not under the guidelines at the moment. But I believe personally that is, uh, that is the future and we will have around 20 to 25% of the patients who show complete clinical response will in future will be put in watch and wait group. And there is an international group of people which are called international watch and wait group people who are very closely following this and trying to publish more and more data. So Angelita Habergama showed, showed us that you know, local recurrence may develop in 31% of these patients. And around 16% of this recurrence develop in first year. And salvage therapy is possible in 90% of these patients and organ preservation in 80% of these patients who were otherwise probably would have gone for uh, abdominal perineal resection. So I would like to end my talk by saying that the approach to rectal cancer is multidisciplinary. Do not have any ego. However powerful we feel as a surgeon, or as radiation oncologist or as medical oncologist, but let's not forget biology is the king, cake selection is the queen, and the technique maneuvers undertaken are prince and the princesses of the realm. This was said by Blake Caddy in the presidential address to the Society of Surgical Oncology. And I cannot 
impressed upon the role of a team together everybody can achieve more thank you very much uh thank you very much deep for that uh, very uh, comprehensive uh, overview of uh, the current scenario of management of rectal cancer uh and i'm sure uh, you yeah, will have many uh but just to you know start a bit of a discussion uh before we have any questions from the audience uh through the chat box uh you mentioned about uh staging uh m uh, with his uh, endo ultrasound and you know with the time uh, mri access has increased in the whole country as against the use of endo ultrasound which is user dependent so just for a clarity for everyone if one have to choose one modality for a pre operative staging and work up which one would you suggest there is no debate about that professor lal that mri pelvis is the superior most investigation for local staging obviously as i said you would require a ct scan of upper abdomen and chest or or a pet scan whatever you choose but for local staging if you have to choose one investigation mri pelvis in rectal protocol is the investigation of choice i think that message is uh, gone very clearly now to the audience also let me know would you do a pet ct scan in all your cases pre operatively because uh, how would you how would you uh, you know go about to say that this is an m0 or an m1 disease pre operatively so i am not fond of pet scan as p but in patients who have a poorly differentiated adenocarcinoma patients who have a very high cea and routine ct scan has not picked up i would probably do a pet scan and also patients who after new adjuvant treatment to make sure that the disease has not progressed uh in how many uh, cases would you have picked up uh, or would you have encountered uh, a metastasis where you had not done a pet scan earlier and regretted and not having done it so so uh, dr dr lal what happens unfortunately in my practice 90% of the time patient carries a pet scan before he is referred to us yes. that is the problem <laughs> so but yes couple of times i have had to burn my fingers where i have not got a pet scan done and the ct scan chest and abdomen and the abdomen have not picked up any metastasis ca was high this is a poorly differentiated adenocarcinoma and immediately after the surgery when this patient was being referred to Uh, for the chemotherapy adjuvant chemotherapy and the medical oncologist did a pet scan and he found uh, you know nodule in lung so you know but one can also argue that you know the time yeah, gap so. between is probably led but we don't know but yeah i think so i think as you rightly said uh, larger lesions uh, you know advanced t2 and beyond maybe they are the ones where one should have a high index of suspicion and maybe uh other factors poorly differentiated poorly differentiated cancer and yes. high ca i think yes. probably yeah i think dr sunil raised his hand would you like to come in here for yeah, some yeah yeah uh excellent lecture deep i just wanted to ask because we were on investigation i thought i might one question regarding investigation uh you made it very clear that mri pelvis and uh, pet ct or ct chest and upper abdomen is very much required now practically what is happening is many a time we are getting the patient already has ct scan done outside you know may not be in a high volume cancer ct scan center where uh, it is uh, showing everything and uh, because of the uh, affordability of patient many a time they are not willing to go for another ct scan or mri or say for example even pet ct so this is a practical problem so how to go about in such a situation i completely agree with you professor popert it is most of the times not because of lack of funds it is lack of ignorance because most of these patients are either referred by gastroenterologists or physicians by that time by the time they come to us what they have first a ct scan of the abdomen and then a pet scan abdomen no i refuse to operate on these patients the person who can afford a pet scan a person who will afford a surgery it is imperative because the whole narrative is going to change on an mri and believe me 
Most of the time when PET scan or CT scan is showing a localized pelvic disease, when you do an MRI, it is T3 plus disease. Yeah. So I think as a matter of principle, I would request and urge all my colleagues not to operate without a pelvic MRI, any rectal cancer. Point well taken, Dr. Uh, Deep. Uh, tell me, how often does your uh, surgical approach get changed uh, on the basis of your pre-operative MR or CT in terms of approach uh, of uh, the surgery, the extent or the way that you are going to handle it basis the MR report or is it the constant? It doesn't matter. Whatever it says, you would be doing the same uh, approach. No, no, no. Obviously. As a surgeon, as, as I said in my presentation, my tendency is to do an upfront surgery, but only in T1, T2 lesions or, or the selected lesions, which are of good biology, node negative, where I'm sure that the disease is within the mesorectal envelope and I would be able to take that envelope out. So you mentioned about new adjuvant uh, chemotherapy and you mentioned about short course and long course. Uh, and the difference between the two. What is your, what is the pitfall of a long course chemotherapy uh, when you are doing it? And uh, what would you be giving a message to the surgeons in terms of uh, additional protection that you might like to do in such patients? So I would say that, you know, you must have a very good understanding with your oncologist because they are the one who, who are going to look after the, the patient and they are the one because whatever you may say, once patient goes to tumor board and after that to the oncologist medical or radiation, patient is like to listen to what they are saying. So I, we have a very clear understanding. People who are coming from far away, who are not from Delhi, who are from either some different country or from out of Delhi, and they need to get treatment in Delhi in terms of radiation. If tumor is not very bulky, I would do a short course radiation, followed by surgery, followed by chemotherapy. But people where who are local resident, who have a bulky tumor, difficult tumor, I would like to give them a long course therapy. And, and after therapy, is, wait for 8 to 10 weeks before we operate. Reassess, obviously, at 8 right. weeks. Another common problem is that people do MRI after neoadjuvant treatment very early. They will do MRI at 4 weeks. It is of no use because we are not going to operate until 8 to 10 weeks. So first MRI, which you should do, is after 8 weeks. Yes, uh, what I was trying to maybe point out is that uh, you would uh, be guarded with patients who have given a long course and maybe give them a protective uh, ileostomy uh, right. to do it as a, as a practice. That is what I was trying to come at. I'm so sorry. Yeah, sorry for not getting it. So yes, in our department, most of the patients, because a huge percentage of our patients have already received new adjuvant treatment, our tendency is to do a protective ile ileostomy, except in young individual who do not have other comorbidities and the surgery has gone off very well. That means I have not used most staplers to fire the distal rectum and the blood loss has not been much and there are no other comorbidity. I, I probably, and leak test is negative. I am happy with the donuts. I would probably get away without doing in stoma. But as a matter of fact, most of the patients who have received new adjuvant treatment will receive uh, in stoma. Uh, you mentioned about, uh, you know, uh, total new adjuvant therapy, you know, uh, just the entire course being completed uh, before you go in for definitive surgery. How often does you end up doing that in our surgical practice here? In At India? the moment, around 5 to 10%. Yes, maybe they are only the advanced ones which, uh, you know, just have to be left onto that and they are really fixed tumors and then yes. uh, they may become operable. Uh, operable. You, know, with that. you want to give them the complete advantage of the new adjuvant treatment. Uh, you mentioned about uh, the the you know the importance of uh, total mesorectal excision. Uh, what are your views on prone jackknife uh, mesorectal excision, which is now the trend in the US and the UK, especially for low rectal cancers? ELAP. You you mean you know this is done for basically ELAP now uh, in the jackknife position. I yeah, personally prone, do. Uh, it's a yeah. prone basically. It's a prone. You know, uh, in most of the times when it is low rectal cancer, you do the uh, abdominal one from your uh, laparoscopic side, mobilization, and actually the actual part of it is left to the surgeon who is on the perineal end, who is actually clearing the, uh, yeah. the, 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 the cancer from the adjoining fat and muscles. 
and uh, it's called, it's called extra levator extra levator yes. abdominal perineal section and uh, so basically they tend to form a waste around the around the area so uh, what are your views and how often do you use it in your practice it is a very good technique uh, dr lal unfortunately we are not very well trained in doing elaps in jack knife position i have done only for two patients where i had no option but to do an elap but in my practice normally the incidence of elap is not very high but i think it's a good technique uh, it is something which should we learn yeah i think yeah, I, th i think it's important as you said you were showing the pictures uh, beautiful pictures of the envelope of the complete uh, mesorectal excision uh, you also mentioned uh, in the in your talk that there is no uh, difference to show between laparoscopic versus uh, robotic versus open in terms of outcome in what way is then laparoscopic of any advantage whatsoever so uh, the tme which you do the tme done by minimal invasive surgery under magnification under term illumination is far more easy to do in my opinion as compared to open procedure yes. so and also benefit of early recovery benefit of early return to bowel activity less pain less and blood loss wound morbidity wound morbidity and, and wound morbidity so any major abdominal incision which gets infected will definitely have an incisional hernia will have dressings for a couple of weeks so all those morbidity as i said are definitely much much less in minimal invasive peak and uh, how many percentage of cases are you following the uh, enhanced or the eras uh, approach the enhanced 100% recovery? irrespective irrespective of the type of surgery we do whether it's an open surgery forget about rectal surgery though obviously we have learned it from the rectal surgery but in in bariatric surgery in other any other hepatobiliary surgery eras is something which we follow and you will be surprised today after pancreatic or did not we we do not keep a rice tube in the patient and that that to our surprise when we started doing this we now find that, that incidence of gastric emptying is much less uh in what percentage of cases in a rectal excision would you would you be requiring to go up to the splenic flexure for mobilization because not, that is not more than yeah uh, which is not, not more than 25% of cases not more than 25% so what is your uh, what is your benchmark to say that uh, you need to go or you don't need to go how do you decide that for the for the early uh, people in the audience to take home a message so what we do when we are taking down our iim pill i i do low ligation after the left colic vessel is given at the same time what we are doing we are lifting the mesocolon from the gyrota spatia up till the spleen where till we start seeing the spleen and then after obviously the the you know demarcation line is appeared at that time in the proximal colon and then we see whether the proximal colon is going down to the pelvis or not if we think that it is not going down then we need to go uh, you know in between the uh, gastrocolic omentum and of course uh, the final anastasis should be lying absolutely tension free into the pelvis rather than being stretched like a bridge uh, you know sometimes what happens dr lal since the patient is in the uh, you know head down position, head down position sometimes yes. you get the impression that you know anastomosis is under tension but as you rightly said one should not hide behind that one should really try make an effort to see that it is not under tension whether you do head up at that time and make sure or with experience you know that you know how much stretches uh, you can yeah. afford absolutely and you know a uh, lot of us you know at the, even at the end of that uh, uh, anastomosis would uh, you know go back and do a little bit more mobilization so that the anastomosis really falls down into the uh, absolutely you showed uh, beautiful pictures about icg uh, uh, being used to check the vascularity in the current age how uh, important do you think is for a surgeon to have it as an armamentarium is it a must or can a gross uh vision uh just by i uh, tell a surgeon that this anastomosis both ends are looking good to go you know so dr lal as i said the the most important proof is if you can visualize the pulsating vessel at the edge you know you if you focus your camera and you see pulsating vessel in the mesocolon there you know that this is a well vascularized end but a lot of times in laparoscopy believe me it is difficult to differentiate you know you, you are very jiffy 
that is this plus minus and obviously you don't want to leave that bowel to chance so as a matter and if you are not using icg in every case it becomes difficult to interpret the result of icg if you do once in a while so i i in, in our department we would do icg in most of the cases if the instrument is available at that particular point of time uh one of the dreaded complications after a low rectal anastomosis is of course a leak and as you had mentioned in your talk uh that uh, leak has now been reduced by use of such uh, advances however still subclinical leaks are well known you know about 5 to 10% subclinical leaks are there and thankfully they don't become uh, clinically important however for the younger surgeons in the audience today what would be the red flag signs that you would be worried about which your residents or uh, your nurses uh, report to you which would uh, you know alert you that something is going to wrong and you want to go back inside very quickly especially if you have not done a protective ileostomy so i think the deep, the you know the way to deal with any complication is in our department we are very clear if the patient is is sneezing even a sneezing possibly it is stomatic leak until proved otherwise so the point which i am trying to put forward is that one has to be very very vigilant any patient who is not doing well whether it is in terms of tachycardia if it is a tachypnea a patient sweating you know patient having vasovagal one should make sure that you are not dealing with an stomatic leak and the easiest way to do is in a ct scan and if you have a localized leak you can put a radiological drain if you have a systemic signs with the leak obviously you need to take that patient up for surgery as soon as possible and you can still go with laparoscopy do the washing thorough washing and put drains Absolutely. and if you have not if you have not made stoma in the first surgery make a stoma now absolutely i think uh, uh, the the thumb rule is that if these patients are not looking absolutely fit and fine next day morning they are not there something absolutely wrong because they uh, actually look like uh, patients like after a lab cholecystectomy if they are absolutely, absolutely. okay if they are not uh, looking that well then that means something is really wrong and one should investigate further i wanted to ask about a scenario of a patient who has uh, come with uh, an asymptomatic primary no bleeding per rectum no obstruction and uh, has been referred by your physician colleague with uh, widespread metastasis secondaries in the liver and all over the place what is your approach to the primary in these cases it's a little bit of a tricky question no i, I we are very clear about this if in an asymptomatic primary with multiple metastases i will refer that patient for the medical oncology no question about it uh they sometimes uh, send it back to you that you uh, get a better histology or the if you remove the primary then the chemotherapy is going to work well is does that uh, logic uh, hold any i don't think i don't think at present that concept is uh, very prevalent uh, they would give uh, you know chemotherapy to these patients and obviously depending upon the general condition of the patient and after chemotherapy we will assess the response of the, the patient and then decide whether we need to do something to the primary also a lot of factors will come into play what is the age of the patient what are we expecting you know from the treatment a lot of things and also if it's a sort of an obstructive lesion even if it's an obstructive lesion i would put in a stent in these patients and do a systemic management if a stent is not possible then you do a stoma and refer them to only if the patient is bleeding and losing okay. blood losing hemoglobin yes. i would or of yes an extension uh, by patients. operative measures absolutely yeah, otherwise no. well summarized for thing there are a few questions in the chat box from the audience some of them are asking have you used uh, liquid biops for uh, crm uh, yet in india no i have so what is its current status in the world i think it is it is not yet a protocol in anywhere but it is coming in a fast way we need to get the cost turn and uh, availability of doing the genetic imprinting in in you know most of the places at the moment i don't think it is routinely used yes i think it's still uh, in a, in a more evolutionary phase and uh, still being uh, under trials in the in currently in the west uh, is another question is to say if you pick up uh, some mediastinal retinopathy pet scan in a case with c rectum how are you going to sh be sure that whether it is malignancy or whether it is something like tuberculosis uh, you know just another active disease which has been picked up 
Yeah, so uh, what, in our department, we will discuss with the medical gastroenterologist and we will request them and ask them whether they can approach this mediastinal node through endoscopic ultrasound. If they are comfortable, fine. Otherwise, we will request our pulmonology colleague to do EBUS, endoscope, endoscopic bronchoscopic ultrasound biopsy. And you need to do an FNST and prove that's the percentage of a PET scan in our country because it picks up so many lesions which are not metastatic, any kind of heel tuberculosis, inflammatory lesions. And sometimes lesions are in the deep parenchyma, which you can't, you know, approach and you need to, if at all, then you need to do a, you know, lobectomy to get a biopsy. And, you know, in those patients, you will discuss in great detail that these are the problems. The option is that we, we keep this lesion as an indeterminate at this point of time. We get away and do our primary treatment. And then we follow this this lesion with PET scan when we do adjuvant treatment. Uh, that's uh, great. And uh, you mentioned uh, in uh, your talk about uh, Denonvillier's fascia uh, being important for your lower mid and lower rectal uh, surgery. You know, we need to go anterior to the Denonvillier's and that is something uh, which is the most tricky part. When you come to preserving the nerve supply, uh, you know, for the, um, for the young male, if it is in the sexually active age group. Uh, what are your tips and tricks to, to sing of in, in such cases? So what we believe and what we do in our department, we do the posterior dissection as far as possible first, rather than focusing on anterior or lateral dissection. Once you have made the tunnel posteriorly as far as you can, then you come from posterior to laterally, posterior laterally on one side, posterior laterally on the other side then you are able to pull the rectum out of the pelvis. Once you are able to do that, there is a lot of stretch anteriorly. And then with the help of your assistant and retraction, you are able to, you know, see a lot of good planes. And then you follow those planes from laterally to anteriorly. And if you remain in a good plane, it is never a problem. And obviously, since we are used to, of, you know, minimal invasive technique and robotic surgery, the vision is, I, I wish I had shown a video of robotic uh, LAR. I mean, it is a treat to watch those planes. Absolutely. Well said. And what is your method to uh, detect uh, or do a uh, intraoperative leak test? So what we do is we use a uh, fired stapler to operate the proximal bowel occlude. And then from below what we do, we put in a 10 millimeter trocar and connect it with the gas insufflator and fill the pelvis with the water. So, uh, so, air bubble uh, test. Air bubble test. Right. I think uh, uh, we have uh, handled all the questions in the chat box. I would request uh, doc, uh, Dr. Sunil Popper to, uh, you know, come in and uh, ask a few questions. I think he's uh, got some questions on his panel. Yeah, uh, Deep, uh, excellent uh, lecture and Professor Pavanindralal, excellent discussion with uh, subject to the topic. Uh, I'm very pleased to read out a question from our dear friend, Dr. Vargis Kurian from South. In the coming years, what should be the major considerations for surgical management of GI cancers? It's a broad question. Very briefly, you can touch up. Yeah, I'm, uh, I am not sure how to answer the question because as, uh, as our imaging is developing, one thing is very sure that, you know, uh, the room for surprise during the surgery is very little now. Because most of the times we will know what we are dealing with. We may still have, you know, odd cases, especially in carcinoma stomach where peritoneal metastasis can be missed. And also I think uh, what is going to happen, as I said, in rectal cancer treatment, that genetic imprint is going to be coming in a very, very big way. We will know from a very young age that who is prone for what kind of cancers. And that I think is going to be a game changer. Also, more and more target-specific chemotherapy and agents are coming, uh, which are going to make uh, the treatment less and less toxic. And wait and watch uh, group is also coming in big way, whether it is rectum or whether it is esophagus. These are the two organs at the moment uh, where it is coming in a big way. Uh, yeah. Dr. Deep, uh, you uh, uh, mentioned about one centimeter as uh, one or two centimeter as the acceptable distal uh, margin. Margin. Now, uh, one of the things that uh, uh, comes up is because we uh, 
put the specimen into the formalin and if you seen formalized uh, specimens uh, really shrink so what you see as uh, 1 to 2 cm intraoperative actually uh, becomes much less for the pathologist so uh, do you are, are you doing a, a, a accurate assessment with the specimen per absolutely se, uh, to absolutely. mark it out for the pathologist you know just a little so not, for the surgery. so there are a couple of things which we do dr lal one is a video documentation of the surgery especially all the important steps that's very important for the quality control second pathologist tells you about the macroscopic assessment of the of the specimen third we open the specimen in front of the pathologist and we measure the distal margin with the scale and take a click a photograph but and that is when pathologist is in the or is it pathologist comes to or yes all right of course yes. okay he has a lagina. All of us no, I think don't it, have it. Amazing. <laughs> so, so Sunil, I think it is a matter of, you know, your interest and how you push your colleagues in different branches. So even for our EUS, the, the pathologists come to endoscopic room and they give you uh, the result immediately. They also tell, you know, the gastroenterologist that the specimen is not sufficient. So, so they can make another pass. That's so wonderful, I think, uh, yeah. It's, it's a matter of how you push your colleagues. We, we get a uh, uh, person for the EUS biopsy, but not in OR otherwise. Uh, our dear friend and uh, respected colleague, Dr. Chiranjeev Khandelwal from Lucknow, he has asked a question regarding the first lecture, when to operate ulcerative colitis for cancer? Is it a duration or symptoms or evidence of cancer? So obviously, it's a, if you are operating for a cancer in ulcerative colitis, uh, it is because of the evidence of cancer in ulcerative colitis and not because of the duration of the disease of ulcerative colitis. And if the severity of the ulcerative colitis is so much that it requires surgery, then obviously it is based on the severity of the ulcerative colitis and not worry about the distant chance of malignancy. So, uh, there is another question uh, from Dr. Vikas Jain. You mentioned about the intersphincteric uh, resection. So, does intersphincteric resection provide enough continence and give significance to save sphincter? Yes. So, initially, uh, we used to think that the coloanal anastomosis after intersphincteric resection will obviously lead to significant uh, incontinence. It is not untrue. But obviously, you need to select your patients very carefully. These patients, you must make a good assessment preoperatively of the sphincter function by doing a PR. So anybody, you know, an old age patient or a lady who has been multiparous may not be a right candidate. Young people who can, you know, in these patients where we suspect that we need to do it, IR resection, we put them on skills exercise much before uh, the surgery when we are preparing them for surgery. But yes, uh, with experience, uh, the continence is not a great issue. Mind you, you are comparing uh, some degree of incontinence from a permanent stoma. So I, we leave the choice to the patient. And you should be very uh, open with the patient that what kind of lifestyle or quality of life patient is likely to have. Most of the patient would choose to have a you know minor incontinence over a permanent stoma with an understanding that if the quality of life is very bad, you know, they will convert to permanent stoma. Yeah. Uh, one last question from me, Deep. Uh, yeah. Many a time, uh, low rectal cancer, in the beginning, we think that it is going to be a temporary stoma. And uh, after the complete treatment, patient still is not in position because of the one or the other reason that you can go ahead and close the stoma. You come across the situation and if you do, what do you do? Very, very rarely, I would say for rectal cancer. More for inflammatory bowel disease than, than cancer. Right. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Professor Pavnindra Lal and Dr. Deep Goel for giving... Uh, thank you very much. The honor to be here. Full Easter justice. High. Thank you, Good sir. Thank you for, for full justice to this topic. And our honorary secretary is here. I will request him to 
give a brief account of uh, COVID task force uh, measures we are taking under the banner of IAGES and uh, also regarding other IAGES online programs. Yes, please come. Thank you, thank you. Can you see my slides, uh, President? Yeah. yeah. And thank you, Professor Sunil Puppet, Kanahavel, for bringing yet another uh, blockbuster today, the prime time with uh, two great speakers. Of course, uh, Professor Sunil Puppet introduced Dr. Adar Saudri. He was a teacher for me too, because all of us know he is a teacher's teacher. A great attribute of any teacher we all know is a clarity and simplicity. I think he made it very simple. And uh, there are lots of take home message. One of the message I liked, even for undergraduates, whole school is a surgeon comes in to cure ulcerative colitis and to treat complication in the case of Crohn's disease. Like that, he made a lot of I mean, take home messages. Thank you very much, others, for making this day apt uh, and a highlight of the uh, today's evening. Of course, thanks, Pavan, for bringing up our uh, uh, best of our friend, Dr. Deep Goyal, today. Uh, speaking a fabulous talk on rectal cancer, and you put him on the seat, and uh, I think all sorts of practical questions, and he answered. He was taking my yes. yeah, yeah, he was really nice, <laughs> very nice. I liked all your slides also. It was wonderful to see your enterprising personality with a elegant presentation. Thank you once again, and I think it's getting better every uh, time we have the episode. And coming to an announcement and an appeal, as you all know, the COVID is uh, very well with us, raging across the country even now as we speak. So we have to put a hold on our uh, uh, on-site program for all of our academics until June, as for our instruction by our president. So we all started on online FAGS already. There are 25 people who have already joined. There are more people joining. From next Monday, I request all of you who are interested in the endoscopy, because that is a future uh, for all the surgeons in the flexible platform. If you want to take online EFAGS, then you can go to the IAGS.in and go into the virtual academy by Medinet, and you can register yourself, and it will be ready for you to join. Because the Obviously, there are various benefits of all this online program. People have a lot of confusion how to come. Because once you register, you can come day and night. If you are working even in the morning in the COVID duty, you can at night at your lesser. Uh, you can go in, log in, and uh, watch one or two modules a day. 30 such modules with a lot of practical points, post-test. Then we'll be taking you for an assessment. Once you clear everything, of course, we'll be all having a colorful convocation in Rajamundri in the early next year. So this is the plan. Please join and uh, make you as a, one of our uh, fellow of either FAGS, the laparoscopy or endoscopy. Coming to an appeal from us, a COVID task for relief, like last time during the first wave we did it. And this time, second wave is uh, needing more and more of all our help. So I think people sitting here along with me, they're all uh, part of the team led by our uh, president himself. So we are seeking a help from you in the form of sending appropriate things like uh, home care kits, like a pulse oximeter, or protecting our uh, friends and family with uh, appropriate N95 mask, or giving uh, lending hands for uh, in the crisis of oxygen, to giving them a concentrator or a BiPAP. So all this. It can't happen without your uh, generous donation. I think we are having uh, donations all coming from various parts of the globe. I always admire the philanthropists sitting everywhere. Please uh, just take a screenshot of this particular account details of our uh, IAGS. And please do send your uh, all your donations to our treasurer. And that will be greatly appreciated. Coming to a, a token of a thanks from me as an organizing secretary, as we did last year an excellent Indo-UK, we had this another blockbuster online uh, program, a digital platform, IHS 2021, and uh, with uh, so much, much more than what we thought, the registrations were touching close to 3,000, with uh, so many international speakers, as you can see, led by our president, our past president, and the uh, organizing chairman, our uh, uh, LP Tangabelu, and uh, so many memorable moments, as you can see, with huh? who's and who in all, not only in IAGS, huh? but everywhere were there. Demonstrated live sessions, lively discussions, Gee. like uh, Dr. Pradeep Chaube and Ajay Kriplani and all mm. people there. And we had a Gee. very exciting panel discussions in all five uh, 
places in a day from morning till evening with a great orations by professor dwadia and uh, raman goyal and uh, great two international orations one by michel of course and uh, again by devi lamento uh, from singapore so we had a wonderful day all these people they were on the stage and it was a wonderful sight to see so many of the international and the national speakers there uh, to see and it looks as if because of the way the transmission was seamless you had that immersive feeling as if you were there literally sitting with them talking to them but for you having a dinner or a dance with them i think you had everything that's the way the digital platform like what we had today like thanks to doc plusers i think they had a wonderful job with the service nitin sitil i think you had done a marvelous job along with the kanakavelu i was watching parallelly apart from here in doc plusers live uh, facebook live youtube live also we are going there and a small thing if you are not able to watch now you can go back again in the ages youtube channel and facebook it will be there for you even for you tomorrow day after and people anxious to receive those uh, precious fellowship certificates and also the colonoscopy book iags new letter because of the covid lockdown we are not able to send by post i'm sure by next week or the week after it will knock your door don't worry about that that's a, a responsibility of the central office so on behalf of our president and our director of the show kanakavel and myself and all my colleagues here i thank you all have a safe uh, night and also jai hind bye bye now thank you thank you sir thank you dr ishwar mohanty sir and i take this opportunity to thank our president and uh, the faculty members for the evening professor lal professor choudhary sir uh, professor deep and uh, everyone who is online and offline on various platforms for joining us this evening i am sure our president will guide us through yet another uh, exciting event in the next fortnight we look forward to more uh, active interactions thank you one and all thank you team doc flexes for this brilliant evening for a flawless platform good night iags good night surgical fraternity thank you thank you everybody good night <clears throat>